Good morning, and welcome to Worship with Christ Presbyterian Church. It's so good to be worshiping together. We come with memories of last Sunday when we called a new pastor, Reverend Jessica Patchett. We come from Ash Wednesday when we remembered who we are without God's breath of life, just dust. That it's useless to go through the motions of worship without doing justice, loving mercy, and walking humbly with God. So God invites us this morning to bring our whole selves to worship, bringing our disappointments, our joys, our gratitude, the hurts we might have caused others and ourselves this week. We bring everything that in worship and truly through our journey together in Lent, God will deepen our connection with God through prayer. So we will ask, as did Jesus' disciples, Lord, teach us then how to pray. So boys and girls, teenagers, young adults, and older, will you join me in the call to worship? As we worship, we recognize that God shows to us the way to find sacred significance even in the most ordinary aspects of life. Lord, teach us then how to pray. As we repeat and share and live into the prayer that Jesus taught us, we ask God to form us as a people of expectation and faith. Lord, teach us then how to pray. In concerning ourselves with the cares and needs of those whom Jesus loves, yet whom the world treats as unlovable, we pray to become healers of deep hurts, bearers of pure love, and instruments of peace. Lord, teach us then how to pray. In this season, in this church, in this world that God embraces and entrusts to our care. Lord, teach us then how to pray. Oh 
struck wonder at the mention of your name. Jesus, your name is power, breath and living water, such a marvelous As we enter this time of confession, hear these words from the book of Isaiah. The Lord says, Come now, let us settle this matter. Though your sins are like scarlet, they shall be white as snow. Though they are red as crimson, they shall be like wool. Today's prayer of confession and assurance are adapted from words by Reverends Carolyn and Bruce Gillette. Both are used with permission of the authors. Please join me in prayer, first together and then in silence. Loving God, we remember that Jesus taught us to pray, saying, Our Father, you created us, you made this world, and you called your creation very good. Yet often, we forget that you are our loving parent who continues to bless your world. Jesus told us that we are in heaven. Yet we fail to live in awe of you. We take you for granted, and we don't see the awesome beauty of the world you have made. We pray, hallowed be your name. We confess that our reverence for you does not always lead us to care reverently for your earth, sky, and sea. Lord, Teach us, then, how to pray with prayer that honors you by sharing your blessing, that serves you by respecting your creation, and that loves you by caring for the world you have made and for all the people who share it with us. The Lord's Prayer is repeated week by week, and we are thankful to listen to what it really says and what it really means. The Lord's Prayer reveals the truth that God is truly awesome, beyond all that our minds can imagine, wholly beyond the limits of all that exists. Yet God is infinitely close to each one of us. The Lord's Prayer offers hope, that a holy God beyond understanding can be our strength and guide when we honor God's name with faith. Whatever our failings, 
Whatever our needs, whatever holds us back from hope and joy, God restores us, forgives us, embraces us, and makes us whole. Thanks be to God. Friends, believe the good news of the gospel. In Jesus Christ, we are forgiven. Friends, the scriptures tell us that God speaks peace to his people. So may we model after our creator, our maker, our redeemer in speaking peace to one another. The peace that we have received from Christ, we share with each other now. May the peace of Christ be with you. Praise God from whom all blessings
Good morning, CPC. Well, obviously, the big news in the news of the church is that we have called the Reverend Dr. Jessica Patchett to be our next pastor. This is great news for us as a church, and Jessica will be starting with us the end of March and will be in the pulpit as of Easter Sunday. Jessica, we we offer you a hearty CPC welcome and look forward to your arrival with us. Just a reminder to all of us to please be praying for the church in this next phase of our transition and growth and being a community centered in Christ. Now, our worship planning team works hard to create meaningful opportunities of worship for all of us. And here we are in the season of Lent. We will continue to have our um, excellent Sunday morning worship services. But in addition, they're creating opportunities for us to have Wednesday evening Lent Vesper services. Up to 50 people will be able to gather up outside in the courtyard, and others can drive up in their cars and listen on the radio. And the first 50 who sign up are able to take a soup supper home with you. So I hope you'll take advantage of the opportunity to be a church gathered safely, distantly, and worship together in those Wednesday Vesper services. You can find out more about how to sign up and a Lent um, devotional that we're making available, the children's ministry t-shirt sales of the Pray, Learn, Act t-shirts, the family, children, and youth ministries sledding opportunity, the oft postponed, now once again rescheduled sledding opportunity. So, of course, uh, you'll find out about all of those things and more in the Wednesday email. Each month, we highlight one of our Learn and Serve partner ministries and have an opportunity to have a minute for mission, learn a bit about who they are and what they're doing, and get an update. And this month, we have our own internal CPC racial justice team ministry update. The racial justice team is a dynamic and active group that's helping lead us in how we engage with issues of racial justice in the Madison community, especially when it comes to our African-American sisters and brothers. So for the Minute for Mission and this update on the racial justice team, I'm turning you over to Jamie Wood. Jamie? Greetings from the racial justice team here at CBC. Today we wanted to tell you a little bit about who our group is what we do, and invite you to join us in seeking justice together. God created all humans in God's own image. Unfortunately, we recognize that in reality, our brothers and sisters of color have not been treated as such. For hundreds of years, they have been enslaved, imprisoned, kept down, and shut out. Our group seeks to engage those of us here in CPC on a path toward being more anti-racist, to be allies with African Americans in our community, and to see God's shalom or justice be brought about here on earth. We believe that a more equitable Madison for the most marginalized among us is a better Madison for all. This call is not just for adults, it extends to everyone. We seek to do this by providing opportunities and resources for learning and action. Most of these are conveyed in our weekly Wednesday Racial Justice Spotlight. Check it out for the most current opportunities. In it, we pray, learn, and act together. Prayer is at the heart of all that we do. We pray for those most impacted by the injustices in our world and institutions. We pray for the courage and guidance to speak into those injustices. Learning is continuous. No matter if you've been active in these issues your whole life or if you are just starting out, there's always room for growth. We do that individually and collectively. This is where opportunities abound. Books to read, classes to attend, workshops that are offered, discussions to have, we're all on a journey. Finally, we are called not just to learn, but to act. There are individual opportunities like writing letters to public officials calling out injustice, providing time and talents to Black-led organizations, 
speaking into these issues in our own spheres of influence, and being honest with friends and family. We also act as a church, and when we act collectively, power is amplified. We would love you to join us on this journey. We work with many wonderful partners that are doing incredible work in our city and state, such as Moses, a faith-based organization that seeks to build collective power to dismantle the systems of mass incarceration and mass supervision, and to eradicate the racial disparities in our community that contribute to them. Go to a monthly meeting and find out more. Or Nehemiah, a faith-based organization that focuses on building allies, helping people who were formerly incarcerated re-enter society and engaging the greater Madison community to empower African-American individuals, families, and communities. They offer lots of tangible ways that we can engage. Justified Anger is an organization that trains people to be allies through an American history course. If you haven't taken this course yet, let us know. It is life-changing. And finally, Man Scholars, a program that provides support to primarily students of color who are often the first in their families to go to college. To get involved, look at the Racial Justice Spotlight in your Wednesday email, or email Rich or Jamie. In the days and weeks to come, we're going to be praying, learning, and acting on generational wealth. For many of us, our families are privileged to have a legacy of wealth and home ownership that they are able to pass down to us. However, for many families of color, they have been denied home ownership for generations, and many forces and institutions continue to prevent them from passing along wealth to other families today. We hope you'll join us. What does the Lord require of you to do justly, love mercy, and walk humbly with your God? Micah 6, 8. Bye. The scripture reading for today comes from Psalm 51. Have mercy on me, O God, according to your steadfast love, according to your abundant mercy, blot out my transgressions. You desire truth in the inward being, therefore teach me wisdom in my secret heart. Purge me with hyssop, and I shall be clean. Wash me, and I shall be whiter than snow. Let me hear joy and gladness. Let the bones that you have crushed rejoice. Hide your face from my sins, and blot out all my iniquities. Create in me a clean heart, O God, and put a new and right spirit within me. Do not cast me from your presence, and do not take your Holy Spirit from me. Restore to me the joy of your salvation, and sustain in me a willing spirit. Then I will teach transgressors your ways, and sinners will return to you. Deliver me from bloodshed, O God, O God of my salvation, and my tongue will sing aloud of your deliverance. O Lord, open my lips, and my mouth will declare your praise. For you have no delight in sacrifice. If I were to give a burnt offering, you would not be pleased. The sacrifice acceptable to God is a broken spirit, a broken and contrite heart. O oh God, you will not despise. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. On this first Sunday in the season of Lent, as we begin taking an in-depth look at our Lord's Prayer, we ask ourselves, how do we hallow God's name? Well, Let's begin with a trip down memory lane. When I first went to seminary at Princeton Seminary, well, I was late. Not, not late as usual, but just late. Because I was engaged as a college student and planning a large Presbyterian-ish national conference. And so I got permission to arrive late to begin my first year of seminary. And in many ways, it seemed like a mistake because I missed that very crucial first week of the professors throwing around large theological terms, which meant I didn't know what. 
when I got there for the second week. But I did receive some confirmation that I was meant to be there. I did need to have a church weekend seminarian job to help pay the bills, and I thought I had missed out on every opportunity because I was late. However, there was one late entry from a church that gave me a job. It was the only church available. Yay! So then I met the pastor that weekend, and his first name was, yes, Tom. And his middle name was Edward, which is my middle name. And so I had a pretty good idea that this was indeed divinely arranged. In that church, over two years as a seminarian and one extra year as a postgraduate intern in Christian education, I learned so much. For this pastor, this pastor was, uh, he was a powerful and a convincing preacher. And before every sermon, I noted that there was a verse from Scripture that was recited, Lord, open thou my lips to which the congregation then responded, and my mouth shall show forth thy praise. It was rather King James Version type. It was very powerful every week. Only later did I learn that the source of that particular verse was from Psalm 51, which we heard this morning. And I learned the context of it as well. This is a psalm that was ascribed to King David as are many of the Psalms. And this one is, as one writer put it, not for reading, but is meant to be wailed. King David had been convicted by the prophet Nathan of not only wanting to take Bathsheba as his wife when she was married to a soldier, Uriah, but David also engineered Uriah's death on the battlefield in order to do it. David is in utter anguish over his betrayal of his devotion to God and of his role as the ruler of God's people, so much so that he pleads with God to purge me with hyssop, which is a traditional treatment in ancient Hebrew culture for, for having leprosy. That's how he felt. If you read the entire psalm, David cries out, Against you, you alone have I sinned, and done what is evil in your sight. Let the bones you have crushed rejoice. Wow, I thought, it would be tough to make this into an upbeat hymn. It, it seemed like that there was this big disconnect between acknowledging the vast dif distance that we feel from God's will and God's ways and the limits of our ability to change, to re repent, to turn toward God with any real joyful expectation. How could David in that same psalm proclaim, O Lord, open my lips and my mouth will declare your praise? But over those years of listening to such earnest preaching from the, the other Tom, hearing the deep yearning and even the anguished acknowledgement in those years in his sermons that justice for people in the nearby big city was so hard to find, and that the poor became poorer and their advocates fewer and fewer, while suburban life cranked right along as if situations a few miles over didn't even exist. He preached it because he felt it, like his own crushed bones were crying out. But he kept coming back to praise God in every sermon, to bring forth hope as a sign of the divine presence, the divine name amid urban decay, to preach with an expectation that, that God could instill in that church and in that society, a desire for truth in the inner being. So when that other Tom preached, <laughs> I didn't always follow every thought 
in the sermon to completion because, to be honest, it was very intellectual, much more than me at that fledgling theologian stage. Yet I, I felt that I had heard the voice of a prophet, whether a Nathan-type prophet or an Isaiah or Jeremiah, calling me to prayer, to, to hallow God, which means to honor and cherish the divine that we perceive in our midst. As much as anything I learned in seminary, from that preaching, I learned both an, an inspiration and a burden to, to hallow God in each sermon, in each prayer, in each day of, of ministry, in each day of life, expecting that hallowing of God to make a difference in me and perhaps a difference beyond me in, in this world. In other words, to preach about God's love and gifts and grace is not an end in itself. Preaching doesn't stop with the amen at the end of a sermon. As the wonderful theologian and teacher and scholar Barbara Brown Taylor summed it up so well, Christians are called to understand God's grace as something more than the infinite remission of our sins. If we want to take part in the divine work of redemption, then we will also understand God's grace as a gift of regeneration, complete with new vision, new values, and new behavior. It's that last one, new behavior, that trips us up, isn't it, folks? New behavior. I got slapped in the face, figuratively, with that realization once when, when a church member, a church officer, no less, came up to me after church and criticized my preaching and, and told me to lighten up. What do you mean, I asked, and I didn't expect this particular answer. Because he said to me, you keep preaching that we are supposed to change our behavior and take care of the world. I don't come to church for that. I come to church to be built up, to be pumped up on Sunday, to be strengthened for the Monday through Friday rat race. In the business world, you have to do whatever you have to do to succeed. It's dog eat dog out there. And if I have to, to cut corners or cheat to be successful, to, to win, then, then, then I will. I do. But when I come to church, I want to be told that I'm, I'm good enough, that I'm okay. Not to be told to change anything. Well, <laughs> Fred's for once, I was totally speechless. <laughs> Ultimately, I think I muttered something like, well, thank you for sharing your perspective or some nonsense like that. I will not admit what I was thinking. But that may just be the issue. You see, Jesus with the Lord's Prayer, Jesus is meddling. He is messing with the way that we choose to do things. If, if we can just recite this prayer without thinking too much about it, about what we're saying and what we're praying, then we can, we can go on doing what it is that we do, and then we can recite it again next week and the week after that. But will it change us? It was a university chaplain who recalled once, he said, a, a young woman came up to me following a Bible study on campus where I'm the campus pastor. She introduced herself and told me a little about her relatively new Christian faith, and then she thanked me for leading the Ash Wednesday service. Now, it was the middle of October at the time, and I assumed that she had her novice liturgical wires crossed. But sure enough, she was talking about Ash Wednesday almost seven months after the fact. In explaining herself, she said, a friend made me go. I'd never been to an Ash Wednesday service before. My church back home never did anything like that. 
with the, the ashes and all. And at first, I was pretty freaked out about it. I was surprised at, at how ashamed and, and embarrassed those ashes made me feel. I found myself avoiding public places. I, I almost didn't go to class for the rest of the day. But, but that whole day was so powerful for me. Walking around with that big black mark on my forehead, and the more I thought about it, and still think about it, I began to feel so hopeful. I know that sounds strange, but that service felt so honest. I am not the person I want to be, and, and deep down I know that, but most church services just feel like a strung out apologies. But since that day, I feel like God can change me, that God wants to change me, and that feels hopeful. The scripture said, You, O God, desire truth in the inward being, in the inner being. Therefore, teach me wisdom in my secret heart. When Jesus taught his disciples, that's you and me, the prayer to pray, he indeed was meddling. He was making us change. Our Father who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. If God is our parent, then we each and every one are God's child. If heaven is, as Jesus taught, a realm of God that is present in every place, right beside you, right within you, then the God in heaven is the God beside and within you and me. And if a name is the most intimate thing in the Hebrew culture that can be revealed and spoken, then Jesus is telling us that God has already taken the risk. God has declared divine love for us. God has given us truth to our inner being. So we honor God. We hallow God's divine name by changing, by changing ourselves, by changing our church, by changing our community and city and our region, by changing the patterns of hatred and separation in our culture, by changing the boundaries that divide haves from have-nots, by changing the same old ways of doing, thinking, acting in our faith, changing Christianity from passive to active. Jesus is meddling. The disciples didn't realize it yet. Nice prayer, Jesus. Sure, we can say that. And we often don't realize it either. Nice prayer, Jesus. Yep, we say it every week. Hmm. I guess the other Tom was also meddling. He was making an impressionable, then very young seminarian take church more seriously than robes and rituals, sacraments and services, meetings and messages. So what does the first line of the Lord's Prayer call us to do? How do we pray it? We change something. Just one thing. That's all. You choose. I'll choose. Just change something. Something that will honor and cherish the name of God in your faith, in your life. How hard can that be? we had better pray. Lord God, open our lips and 
Our mouths will declare your praise. It sounds so easy until we apply it to our lives in real time. So God, help us. Inspire us when we least expect it. Be at our side in this journey of Lent. And give us courage. Give us courage to pray as Jesus taught us seriously in ways that change the world, or at least change our part of the world. Father who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Amen. Please, pray with me. Almighty and everlasting God, we thank you for your gift of presence as we gather virtually to worship you. Thank you for your unconditional love. You love us despite our shortfalls. Like David, many years ago, we come humbly before you, admitting our sins, acknowledging that we have sinned against you. In your loving compassion, we pray that you would forgive our transgression and cleanse us from our sins. Have mercy on us, O Lord, in your loving kindness, and create in us a clean heart and renew the right spirit within us. As we are renewed by your Holy Spirit, teach us to demonstrate love, kindness, and compassion in our daily lives. Prepare our hearts as we enter the Lent season. Heavenly Father, we're grateful that you inspired and guided the work of the PNC that led to the call of the Reverend Dr. Jessica Patchett, our new pastor. Thank you for giving the PNC faithful and willing hearts, clear minds, humility, love, and collaboration that led to a diligent and smooth selection process. We lift up Pastor Jessica to you as she wrap up her ministry in Atlanta and get ready to lead your church family here at Christ Western Church. We pray that you would equip her with all that she needs to succeed in her ministry here. Grant her a loving heart, leadership, vision, wisdom, and faithfulness. God of grace, we come before you at this time with the many challenging issues that we face in our personal lives, in our country, and in our world. We need your help and wisdom, especially in these troubled times of COVID-19, economic hardships, natural disasters, and political divisions. In the midst of turmoil 
and uncertainty. As the virus continues to cause damages, and the very economic and social fabric of our life is shaken, many of us are gripped by anxiety and fear. We pray for the countless number of people affected, those who have lost their jobs, whose life saving and finance have been wiped out. Oh Lord, be merciful to all who have fallen by the wayside. Especially help the weak and vulnerable, the elderly, the unemployed, those facing eviction, homelessness, and food insecurity. We pray for our children whose learning environment has been drastically changed and has been challenging for many of them as a result. Restore hope for all those who are hurting. Be with those who are anxious and miss interaction with family and friends. Surround those who are sick or grieving the loss of a loved one. Comfort our brother Rich Anderson and his family as they mourn the death of his mother, Charlotte, who went home last Sunday to be with you. Eternal God, we pray for wisdom for our nation and our community leader as we seek social, economic, and racial justice. May you show us how to be instrument of your peace and justice every day. We also pray for our world leaders who are making decisions on behalf of the many people you have placed under the authority. Grant them wisdom and discernment and deep compassion. We pray all this in Jesus' name, who taught us to pray. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread. And forgive us our debts, as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory forever. Amen. Amen. The first step on this journey called Lent is the step of readiness, of being prepared for something new, being prepared for changes for which we rarely feel prepared. This is one of the hardest steps to take. We keep thinking that we have forgotten something. But God has called you by name to this journey. And God has given you the divine name to be a traveling companion. You have all that you need for the journey. So go in peace 
and be at peace, knowing that God is going with you toward Jerusalem. Amen.